All right, I guess uh, we'll get going. Uh, thanks, uh, everybody, for coming out. This is External Design Systems and Practice. Uh, I was asked uh, a couple minutes ago if I wanted to have everybody move up. I feel like everybody who made it here at the end of the day deserves to sit wherever they want. So congratulations. <laughs> um, yes, that's right. Um, so uh, there's a little link to the slides, a bit.ly link, uh, external ds-ams, if you want uh, the slides or some resources. They're online. So enjoy. I am uh, Brian Perry. I'm a lead front-end developer at a company called uh, Bounteous. I live in the uh, Chicago suburbs in the US. Um, I think I've gotten uh, past my jet lag, but we'll, we'll find out right now. And uh, I'm a lover of all things uh, component-based and component-driven, so building with components in Drupal and uh, design systems and tools like Pattern Lab and Storybook and increasingly uh, building with uh, component-based JavaScript frameworks like React. And I'm also a lover of all things uh, Nintendo, so if you want to track me down and talk about the cool games you're playing on your Switch, uh, by all means. I'm uh, playing uh, Fire Emblem, and then also started uh, Return of the Obra Dinn on the flight out here, which is like a murder mystery game. It's really great. And uh, I'm available on the internet in a variety of places and would love to internet with you. And uh, as I mentioned, I work at a company called uh, Bounteous. Uh, first and foremost, I want to thank them graciously for sending me out here. A little bit more of a haul than usual uh, coming out to Amsterdam. We have uh, offices throughout North America. Drupal is one of a handful of things uh, that we do, but I get to work with a great Drupal team and learn so much from the folks that I work with. Um, we're often hiring, so if you're looking to do uh, you know, great Drupal work, get in touch, and also if you're looking to have uh, great Drupal work done, uh, I can get you in touch as well. Uh, but if you happen to have, uh, if you know me or happen to have seen me speak, you might be familiar with me working for a company called HS2 Solutions. Uh, I did not quit. Uh, HS2 Solutions about a year ago rebranded as, uh, as Bounteous. And the reason I mention that is because it's kind of the jumping off point into the first of a couple things we'll be focusing on in the time that we have. Um, so our rebranding process, and specifically the things that having a, uh, what we call the design system repository that was an external dependency of the project, uh, what that brought to our rebranding and our, our rebuild. And then uh, later on, after we look at this from more of a traditional CMS architecture, uh, the second half we'll look at some of these concepts applied to a uh, progressively decoupled uh, build as well. So, uh, but starting with the rebranding. So this is our uh, old uh, HS2 Solutions website on the left and uh, the new concept for our Bounty site on the right. And we had a brand launch that was targeted for November 5th, 2018, just about a year ago. And uh, although it didn't feel like it to me necessarily leading the uh, website rebuild effort, the, uh, it was just, the website was just part of a larger coordinated effort. Things like um, press releases and new business cards, email addresses, notifying our client base, things like that. And then also as part of this process, uh, contributing to why we were rebranding, we had uh, a number of acquisitions. So there were a few different sites that we were migrating into our new Drupal 8 build. Uh, the existing HS2 solution site was in Drupal 7. And then uh, Lunametrics and Infill Digital both had WordPress sites. Um, we were specifically focusing on mostly the blog content, especially Luna Metrics. They had uh, years and years of great uh, blog content that we wanted to be able to live on. And uh, Nate uh, took the lead on the migrations, so was working in, a, in our new Drupal 8 repository, uh, working on migrations, having that content land in this new instance. And then meanwhile, uh, Leon on our XD team is starting to work on uh, initial wireframes and early concepts of what this site could look like uh, in Sketch and sharing things in Envision. And I'm doing my best to follow alongside him and do uh, prototyping in the browser uh, using Pattern Lab as a, a tool. So, um, you know, seeing what things actually look like in a browser, giving a chance to be hands on with, uh, you know, non traditional device widths that, that we might not have uh, wireframes for, things like that. And then as the, uh, the concept kind of solidifies, Jolene uh, took the lead on higher fidelity prototypes, but I continued to uh, follow along. 
uh, in that Pattern Lab instance, building out uh, these concepts and some supporting components all in Pattern Lab. So that kind of brings us to the point where we have uh, this design system, we're calling a design system repository um, with these prototypes and some components that we can reuse, and then also the Drupal instance where we start to have content from the uh, existing sites land in there. So we need to um, consider exactly how we're gonna integrate those two things together. And, uh, or what I'm gonna use kind of a somewhat ridiculous example to describe uh, where we wanna put the mustard. So um, I, I also wasn't sure coming out here if, uh, if mayonnaise was uh, just like a, a gross thing in the US, but it's also a gross thing around here, I've confirmed. So, um, but the, the two kind of cases uh, we'll be talking about here is the mustard mayonnaise case uh, on the left-hand side. There's the screenshot from a sketch comedy show. One big jar with mustard and mayonnaise combined in one place versus having your mustard and your mayonnaise, your condiments separate that you can uh, choose to do with as you, as you see fit. So the uh, combined mustard and mayonnaise approach is kind of uh, what I had been doing uh, on projects up until this point. So uh, Pattern Lab or some sort of pattern library tool embedded in a Drupal theme. Um, also pretty common in uh, component-based themes in the community, um, even in the contrib space as well. So there's some advantages and disadvantages to that approach. Um, it's uh, theoretically easier for Drupal to get at your components because they're right there in your theme in that approach. Um, in some ways, that's also gonna simplify the build process. And for developers who might not be familiar with this uh, component-based approach, um, it's a little bit easier for them to wrap their heads around and understand. They look in the theme, the theme things are there, they can change them and see uh, you know, the intended effects. But also at the same time, uh, having that tightly coupled like that, it's uh, prone to Drupal-specific things finding their way into these components. And it depends on your project and how this is gonna be used, whether or not that is actually a problem or not, um, but it, it may be. And then on the other side of keeping the projects uh, independent, that's kind of where we were at this point in time on this project. We had that separate design system repository and a separate Drupal repository. And in theory, that is gonna promote reuse beyond just a single Drupal project that it's embedded in. Could be multiple uh, Drupal projects or themes that it's used on or potentially even beyond just Drupal. So we had to come to a conclusion uh, about exactly what we we're gonna do, where we we're gonna put the, uh, the mustard in this case. And we decided to keep the, uh, the mustard and mayonnaise separate, not this Heinz uh, mayo must, which is uh, actually a thing you can buy in US grocery stores, pre-combined mayonnaise and mustard for people who are really busy, apparently. Um, but some of the, the uh, rationale behind this decision, um, again, it uh, potentially keeps the components more Drupal agnostic or CMS agnostic. Um, I think it also encourages prototyping. So when things are tightly coupled uh, within a Drupal theme, I find that people tend to stand things up in Drupal to see what they might look like or what changes might look like. And uh, if it's a separate project with separate tooling, um, I think people tend to you take advantage of lightweight prototyping more frequently. And uh, you know, it already was a separate project at this point, so it's kind of the path of least resistance. Some other gut feelings uh, that, that go into it, it's always kind of conceptually felt like the right approach to me, even if it wasn't what I actually did. <laughs> and uh, it was also advocated by many in the community whose opinions I, I trust, which is a, a great thing. And there was the suspicion that we might be able to reuse uh, these components on other web projects related to our brand. Uh, although there weren't any hard requirements at, at the start of this project. And it also felt right for our company and the diverse skills of our company. Uh, all these people are not developers and not all of them are front-end developers, but many of them are. And of those front-end developers, uh, some of them don't have experience with Drupal. Some of them specifically do not care about Drupal, believe it or not, here at DrupalCon. Um, but uh, having this uh, set up in such a way that people who can just write good HTML, CSS, and JavaScript, uh, more front-end developers throughout our company could contribute to our website uh, seemed like a, a really positive thing. So now that we uh, landed on that decision, let's talk a little bit about how it's actually structured and, and how um, we included this dependency. So in the design system repository, we just, uh, so 
Uh, first off, worth mentioning, we're using the, uh, the PHP version of Pattern Lab. This is about uh, a year ago, so it's a composer dependency. Um, in the design system, just created a simple composer.json file, uh, giving it a name, a description, and then uh, the installer type of uh, design system, which we you know, essentially just made up in this case. We'll see how that's used in a second. And then uh, in the Drupal project, in the main composer.json file, I had to do a couple things. Um, so we had to add, uh, in the repository section, our uh, Bitbucket uh, git link in this case, um, right next to packages.drupal.org. And then in the uh, extra section here, um, under we added the installer type of design system so that uh, it can be aware of this design system type that we defined. And then under installer paths, uh, we specify where something of a type design system is going to go. Um, so for uh, a Drupal composer project, you know, it'll move modules into uh, modules, contrib, things like that based on this as well. Whoops. Um, we put it in a libraries directory inside of the theme, hopefully indicating that it's a, you know, a hands-off dependency. Uh, a lot of other things we could have done there. We looked at just keeping it in the, the vendor directory, but found that it was, uh, in some cases, challenging to reach deep into the vendor directory to get things like templates in, in a theme. So that's where we landed on that. And then that allows us to uh, composer require the design system repository. So leading up to uh, the, you know, in kind of the pre-launch cycle, we required things at dev, things were moving pretty fast. Um, and then also it allows us to, in the Drupal project, run composer updates. So we have control as to when new and updated versions of the design system are going to be part of the theme. And also we can tag releases in the design system so we can require it a specific release, roll back to a release, all, all that good stuff. And then actually, so now that we have the dependency uh, available, uh, how we incorporate it into the theme, if you're familiar with the component-based uh, uh, theme approach, there's probably nothing all that new here, but in our libraries.yaml file, we created a global, global library that had our compiled assets so uh, a compiled CSS file, our JavaScript bundles from Webpack. And then uh, using the uh, components module, created some twig namespaces uh, so it could uh, have access to the templates from our design system and also give us some shortcuts um, following kind of the structure of our uh, naming convention, not quite the default atomic design naming, uh, but in the neighborhood. So uh, now that we have uh, the dependency available and uh, incorporated into our theme, um, a workflow that we kind of fell into with the, the, uh, the folks that we had working on the project. Um, so we had uh, Sean, who can certainly do Drupal things, but is another uh, developer who I, I think is, uh, is often uh, his best self, writing great uh, just general HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. So he... Uh, worked on a bunch of the remaining components in the design system in the design system repository. So without him, we probably wouldn't have had a theme, um, but he only ended up having two commits in the Drupal repository. And then uh, Wade kind of played the middleman integrating these components into Drupal. So he was wiring up the design system components to content in Drupal, uh, adding things to layouts and layout builder, and most of his effort was in the Drupal repository but he would uh, you know, make some changes in the design system uh, if there were things that weren't considered on the Drupal side or you know, some refactoring to make his life uh, a little bit easier. Um, and in general, we found that, that that workflow, at least with the team that we have, work, worked pretty nicely leading up to the launch. So uh, as is often the case in, uh, in, in any project, we found some uh, scope-related surprises as we, we went along. Um, but specifically ones that having this design system dependency opened up some really interesting possibilities. So uh, the first is the existing Lunar Metrics site. Uh, Lunar Metrics, now Bounteous, offers uh, trainings through North America for uh, Google Analytics, Google Tag Manager, the general Google suite. And they had a training section of their site that would list the upcoming trainings and um, also allow people to sign up and, and register. And we came to the conclusion that we weren't going to be able to re-implement this functionality in, in time for our date. Um, also because there were some changes and, and new features that were just recently added to the site. Um, 
So what we decided we were going to do is keep the WordPress site alive at a uh, subdomain training.bountyest.com and make it uh, match the look and feel of our new Drupal 8 site. And uh, I, I don't know that that would have really been a realistic option if we didn't have these uh, components ready to go and be used in another system. Um, and I also don't know if it was, would even be something that we would have considered in the first place. So uh, the WordPress integration, we worked with a company called Walia Creative um, to handle the, this uh, retheming. They did the initial theme for the Lunametric site, so it was great to have people who were already familiar with what was there. Um, and they actually introduced us, or at least me, to the Timber plugin uh, for WordPress. Um, and that allows you to use Twig in WordPress, um, which is certainly handy given we had all these Twig components. Um, I love their, their slogan here, because WordPress is awesome, but the loop isn't, which personally is something I agree with. Um, so they uh, created an initial prototype um, using the components from the design system uh, and Timber to stand things up pretty quickly and prove that we really were going to be able to create something that matches the look and feel of the Drupal 8 site that we were building. So just a little bit on how that actually works. Um, so this is a, a look at the training uh, uh, landing page. And there's a, a list of all of the upcoming trainings, and so training items in this case. Then in the training module, that PHP template here, we've got a wrapping div with a parent class, uh, and then a for loop that goes through, in this case, uh, course data, and assembles uh, these training elements, specifying the event data that we want passing into uh, an array here. You know, not unlike some of the things we might be assembling in a a twig template or uh, prepping things for a render array. And then in uh, the training element.php uh, template, we're just saying if there is data, we're calling uh, timber render, specifying the template that we want to pass it through uh, from the design system and passing in the data. And that ends us giving us all of the uh, upcoming trainings using the same components, uh, same twig components from the design system. So we were able to create uh, a version of the training page using, you know, keeping WordPress where it was, um, something that really did match the look and feel for our main Drupal 8, 8 site really nicely. Uh, included it in the main navigation and everything. Uh, if you're looking at the address bar, obviously you'll know you're going someplace else and you should be looking at the address bar. Um, but hopefully, uh, visually, it, it's pretty seamless. And then uh, another surprise, really close to launch, we found out that uh, DMAC Media in Toronto was also going to be uh, joining the Bounteous family. Um, and we wanted to rebrand their site as Bounteous.ca uh, for a variety of reasons, including the timeline. We knew that this was going to be a smaller scale effort. Um, it wasn't going to match one to one. But we still wanted to be able to have a lot of the elements of this new brand. Um, and having the, the design system repository, in this case, also really helped the conversation. The first call where we got the developers together, I was able to say, you know, we, we have this repository calling it the design system. Here's what's in it. Here's the tools that are available. And you can use that however you see fit to, to make this uh, challenging timeline possible. And uh, ended up being a, a lot more of a kind of manual selective process, picking and choosing classes and borrowing some markup. Uh, there were some assets that they used wholesale. Um, but still gave us something that had a lot of the feel of our new brand and our new site. So uh, we, we made our November 5th date. Uh, everybody took a, a, a very long nap. And uh, after that, we kind of rolled into our post-launch reality. So uh, at this point, I am uh, kind of ramping off of the day-to-day, -day, and other developers, in this case Kyle and Steve, are coming on to help out. And at this point, uh, the majority of what uh, is coming their way is really Drupal specific. So, you know, uh, bug fixes, uh, things that didn't make the initial scope, um, but they're doing the vast majority of their work in Drupal. And, uh, you know, putting words in their mouth a little bit here, but, you know, uh, faced with the design system, that, that dependency and the kind of slightly different setup here, they're probably wondering, you know, why can't I just Drupal things? Why can't I just reach into the theme? Why do I have to make a uh, commit over here and pull in the composer dependency and all that good stuff. So some lessons learned from that. Um, one is that you know, documentation is, is really important here. 
uh, I think we did a, a decent job of documenting the, the how, like what the process actually looked like, where you make changes, how you pull them in. Um, but in hindsight, it really would have helped to have more around the why. So why are we taking this approach? Um, you know, what advantages does it bring us? What are the other contexts outside of Drupal that it's being used? Um, and you know, what are some of the challenges that we envision? I think that would have uh, changed the conversation a little bit, maybe uh, reduced some frustration. Uh, also uh, became increasingly apparent that it was important to have a really efficient workflow to be able to experiment in the context of your particular CMS. Um, thankfully got this in place before uh, others came on, but um, in this case it was a pretty simple set of gulp tasks that uh, copy things over so you could make changes locally, see what they looked like um, before committing them over to the design system. Um, since then, saw some other uh, approaches to this. So um, there's a, a composer uh, package that lets you do um, like local linking of a dependency, so you can do local development uh, and try out changes that way. Um, now we'd probably be using the Node version of Pattern Lab, and Node has uh, the npm uh, link uh, feature, which lets you sim link uh, a version of a dependency and then swap back to the published version of a package. So that's probably how I'd approach that. Uh, we also found that it was uh, increasingly important to be really strict about versioning. We mentioned that we were kind of uh, requiring it head leading up to launch. Uh, past launch, that uh, obviously did not scale, especially as we were juggling some pretty divergent branches with, with new functionality. So we really need, needed to uh, get better with tagging our releases and pull them in so that we prevented things uh, that landed early in the design system for, to make their way into the Drupal repository unexpectedly. Um, and all this is to say that this uh, external approach does add some overhead. So it's uh, you know, a cost that you have to weigh. I think uh, for this project, it, uh, it definitely had uh, a worthwhile benefit. And then kind of one other thing that we saw is we saw the lines between the CMSs blur in this case. Um, so take the training items and say that we added a, a hover uh, effect. Um, Kristen testing in QA and uh, you know, John in marketing who manages the, the training site. Um, you know, they would expect, uh, if we take on a ticket for that, the change that happens on the, the Drupal homepage would also apply on the, uh, the training landing page in WordPress. Um, and we saw some cases where that, that didn't happen. It did some kind of traditional WordPress theming to get us across that finish line. Um, so after launch, we came back and refactored things and used more of that uh, the timber approach to be able to use the components as they stood um, and make it a little bit easier to pull in the uh, design system dependency into WordPress um, so that more often than not, you know, one change would really apply in both cases. So uh, that's kind of an overview of, of that approach uh, with the uh, traditional CMS and our rebranding efforts. Um, now with uh, the remaining time that we have, we'll talk a little bit about some of these concepts uh, and attempting to apply them in a decoupled uh, build. Um, specifically looking at situations where uh, you're not sharing a template engine. You can't just use Twig uh, everywhere necessarily. So uh, we're gonna look at a progressively decoupled project at a pretty high level, still uh, an ongoing uh, project. Um, but uh, on the Drupal side, we have a uh, element of this. It's a traditional Drupal build, um, but we're also providing uh, APIs to React, default uh, JSON API endpoints, and also some custom JSON API endpoints. And then uh, on the React side, it's consuming those Drupal APIs and essentially uh, providing an authenticated user portal. So then uh, the context of uh, both things uh, combined, um, there's you know, traditional Drupal content, but then also a namespaced uh, route owned uh, by React and that user portal. So that also prevents, uh, presents a number of uh, different developer contexts here as well. So there's uh, Drupal developers and the portion of the Drupal implementation uh, that really isn't going to be interacting with React at all. On the React side, we wanted to make sure that our uh, React developers uh, kind of had the development experience that they uh, are used to. So we wanted to make it easy for them to be able to develop uh, in, in isolation uh, without having to spin up a Drupal environment. So some of that was accomplished through um, mocking services, 
uh, some of it was, uh, you know, uh, environment variables to use our development or staging Drupal environments as APIs. We also want to make sure they had their, uh, you know, hot uh, module replacement so that their changes are reflected uh, automatically in the browser. Um, but of course, there is the very important context of the real-world integration of the portions of the site where Drupal and uh, React are working together and overlapping. So then looking at uh, templating and styles, Drupal obviously uh, uses Twig. The Drupal portion of the project did have some of its own unique styles and components. React is using uh, JSX and did have some of its own unique styles and components. Um, but then in the overlap, there were definitely global styles that uh, applied uh, everywhere. Um, but we did, we were wondering initially if there were going to be a lot of uh, components that we needed to use in both places. We found that there weren't uh, too many of them. And uh, so far, it really hasn't been enough that we've uh, been willing to take on the effort of trying to tackle and solve that problem of, of literally sh using the same component in both places. Um, we'll talk a little bit about, you know, what we think that might look like. Um, but we still had a, a lot of uh, styles that were shared between, and we wanted to be able to use it in all of the different contexts. Um, so, you know, we started wondering uh, if something like a design system, something that lives in the middle, could serve uh, these projects and handle those global styles. Um, so we were considering how we might be able to approach that. Also, around the same time, the uh, continued debate around uh, CSS and JS uh, rages on, as it does to this day. Um, but also around that time, I was hearing a lot about uh, CSS modules as a, an approach to this. Um, uh, John Albin had a great talk in, uh, at, at, in DrupalCon Seattle, uh, giving an overview of these CSS and JS solutions, but kind of zeroing in on some of the advantages of CSS modules. Uh, Gatsby ships with CSS module support out of the box, so it had the opportunity to use it in that context. I think Create React App also uh, ships with support for it now as well. Um, so just uh, a little bit about CSS modules for anybody who might not uh, be familiar with it. It's, uh, it's not a package in the way something like styled components or emotion, other popular CSS and JS, in this case React libraries um, are. It's something that's handled by the, the build process and the a bundler like Webpack. Uh, it scopes the styles locally by default, and we'll uh, look a little bit about you know, what that means. Um, it also plays nicely with uh, SAS, which was uh, useful for our team, and it has this nice, super snarky logo where the modules and CSS modules overflows the container. Ha ha. Uh, so uh, thinking about scoped CSS, we will uh, just look at this little side project about static sites I, I created a little while back, these card components. So here is a uh, project card.module.scss file. Um, the actual styles themselves, not particularly important here, um, but the general structure is the most relevant piece. So we have the parent class of project card, and then we have um, the you know, title, language, description class. Um, we're also not explicitly using like a BEM naming convention here. We certainly could if we want, um, but the, the component scoping is also going to handle some of that namespacing uh, that sometimes people look to BEM for. And then in the component, in uh, project card.js here, we're importing styles from that project card module.css, and that gives us a styles object that we can use in our JSX. So you'll see that we have our, uh, our div and then the class name prop. And uh, at the top level, we're passing in styles.projectCard uh, for that project card class. And then unsurprisingly, styles.language, styles.title. And then if we actually look in a browser and inspect uh, this component, what we get is this. So there's a combination of the um, the, the module name, the class name, and then that kind of unique string tacked on to the end. And that's giving us a class that really is uh, specific and scoped to this component. It's not going to leak out elsewhere. Um, you, unless you did something crazy, you can't, also can't really reuse this class elsewhere either. Um, so it's nice that it gives us a nice encapsulated uh, styles to this component, uh, but also, 
uh, global CSS uh, certainly has a home uh, as well. And uh, it can work uh, in concert nicely with this approach as well. So this is uh, a look if we were just using a, a traditional task partial, doesn't have that dot module extension, which what helps uh, Webpack pick up on it. Um, so if we just say import project card that CSS, that's going to give us uh, these styles in the global namespace. Um, and then uh, we can use the class name prop with just a string passed in rather than that object that we saw before. And uh, these classes are classes that we can use elsewhere. And if they're written in such a way that they would cascade or apply outside of this component, they would. Um, but obviously, that, that it helps quite a bit for styles that are, in fact, intended to be global. So uh, this is uh, kind of the initial approach that we used. Uh, with all this in mind, uh, we had separate repositories for kind of these different pieces, these different contexts. Um, you'll notice that since I say initial approach, uh, it was not our final approach, spoiler alert. Um, but uh, so in the, the design system repository, we had a little Gatsby site that showed these global styles and context and then allowed the uh, different projects to pull these in as NPM dependencies and use those partials as they saw fit. So on the React side, things were imported in JavaScript with a mix of global and component scope. And then uh, there was also some project-specific uh, CSS as well. And then on the Drupal side, uh, still using Webpack, but uh, creating one global CSS file that is a combination of design system partials and uh, things that are specific to Drupal. So just looking a little bit about how um, that was consumed on the Drupal side. Um, so in our uh, package.json file here, we have just a, our Git repository for the design system, which allows us to pull that in. And then uh, Webpack SAS loader, I think in this case, allows you to use a tilde for non-relative imports. And that's what lets us in this example on the right here um, combine uh, pulling in partials from node modules uh, alongside uh, partials from our Drupal theme as well. So again, we can kind of pick and choose the pieces that the Drupal theme needs. So as I uh, alluded to, uh, it was not all that, this approach was not all that well received by the team once we started running with it. Um, managing dependencies in this way uh, was that the team found it tedious. So we had situations where we'd have to make multiple pull requests in different repositories and then have them all land at once for a single feature. Um, we definitely found situations where people new to the project were a little bit unclear on where their changes needed to be made. Um, another thing motivating some of these decisions was the, uh, you know, trying to have that context for our uh, React developers to be able to develop in isolation. And uh, it's not explicitly necessary for that to stand on its own, for that to be possible, even in a shared repository um, that's certainly doable. But also, given it's a progressively decoupled project, uh, at the end of the day, it's really just one website. Um, so we adjusted uh, to using a single repository. Um, so you know, we still had those shared styles, uh, but the different contexts could, uh, again, pull in what they, they need, but also use the tooling that was appropriate uh, in their, their case. So on the React side, use CSS modules, as we talked about, and Storybook as a place to be able to see uh, these components in context. And then on the Drupal side, uh, Webpack to create our, our uh, <coughs> one uh, CSS file and using Pattern Lab to show uh, these things in context. And then uh, you'll also notice that this is a little bit closer to that uh, combined mayonnaise and mustard approach, um, the mayo must that we saw before. Um, but it just happened to be what uh, work the best for this project in this particular group of, uh, of people. So a few, uh, a few lessons learned. So um, not really specific to this project, but uh, using uh, a couple of different Webpack builds that were similar in some ways, but not exactly the same. Uh, some quirks uh, come out of that that can be a little bit of a pain, having things different. Um, we talked a lot about the different approaches to this dependency, and it, it's really just a trade-off. So having multiple repositories does introduce overhead, but on the flip side, we found that you know, going back to having a, a single repository uh, can open the doors to regression. We, we saw more cases where um, you know, a change on the React side has unintended uh, changes elsewhere, 
and you have less control as to when these new uh, global changes come in. And then also, uh, you know, the idea to not over-design your design system, and you know, this would certainly in a lot of ways be on me, but um, you know, looking back on this, is this really a design system? Maybe uh, a little too, uh, too buzzword excited here. Um, it feels like something a little bit different. Uh, shared styles or design tokens that we're using throughout the system um, that probably requires a, a different approach that hopefully we can recognize uh, next time around. Uh, a few things that we uh, aren't doing quite yet. So we, uh, I, I touched on the fact that uh, we're not uh, actually reusing components in, in both places. Uh, mostly we just haven't found enough overlap to make the effort for that um, seem worthwhile. We have seen some small opportunities for uh, shared JavaScript and uh, also haven't invested too heavily into that, but the, the main thing that we're doing when we identify that is trying to write JavaScript in those cases using as much uh, vanilla JavaScript as possible, um, which should at the very least make it easier to port uh, some of that stuff over. And then uh, you know, to actually uh, truly reuse the components here, it would probably require more JavaScript at the end of the day at this particular point in time. Uh, either more React on the Drupal side or building things using web components and using those web components both in Drupal and React. Although I, I understand there are potentially some changes, challenges on the uh, React side doing that, but I, I don't have a ton of experience. Um, we also, although everything's in one repository, we're not uh, taking a, like a traditional mono repo approach, something like the, the Gatsby mono repo, for example, where it has individual like packages published out of it that can be pulled in um, as needed, um, or using a tool like uh, Lerna, I think, is something that can help manage that sort of mono repo dependency on the node side. Um, so we, we haven't done that, uh, but as we mentioned before, I think uh, taking that approach would give us some more of that control uh, that we lost out and we moved to a single repository. And uh, we're using separate tools, uh, uh, you know, pattern library-wise. Um, we're not using Twig and React in a combined storybook. We did look at that initially, um, but didn't find uh, a path to, to making that happen. Since then, there seems to have been a decent amount of movement in that area. Um, at a uh, couple days over the summer, uh, some of the Amazie folks gave a, a talk where they're, they were using Twig in Storybook with the HTML version of Storybook. The latest version of the Emulsify theme, I believe, also uses uh, Twig in Storybook. And then uh, the next release, I believe, of Storybook, they're targeting the ability to use multiple, I think what they call frameworks, in a single Storybook. Um, so going forward, uh, this seems like it might be more of a viable option if we did want to have our Twig components and our React components side by side um, where we can see them together. So uh, kind of uh, coming to the end here, uh, but uh, based on these couple of examples, a question you might be asking yourself is uh, you know, what you should do if it makes sense to have uh, a external design system dependency like this or where you should put your mustard. Um, so some things to consider. You, you know, you're probably not surprised to hear <coughs> that there really isn't a, a black and white all cases answer for this. But um, you know, ask yourself if there is going to be value in reusing these components. Um, uh, sometimes, though, it might be hard to know for sure. Like in the rebranding effort, we really didn't know that they were going to be reused as much as they were. Um, I'd also ask the role that prototyping, uh, you want prototyping to play on this project. I think that um, having the, the pattern library design system uh, less coupled uh, can encourage uh, rapid prototyping. You also have to ask how it's going to fit into your team's workflow and your team's makeup. Um, is it going to uh, allow more people to contribute? Is it going to you know, uh, make it harder for folks to uh, participate? And then a couple things that have come up in past versions of this talk. Um, so you know, there's also the perspective of having this as a separate dependency as a way to help lock down your design system and give you more control over when things are published. Um, you know, when uh, new versions are pulled in, things like that. And then uh, also from the perspective of taking this component-based uh, approach to building in Drupal, um, you know, there's a, a, a whole set of challenges uh, potentially with that, uh, which would be a whole nother talk that many people have given, uh, but I at least wanted to acknowledge that this, you know, this talk doesn't really go into that at all. 
But uh, yeah, the, the kind of at the end of the day, uh, one particular uh, mustard does not fit all. There, I, I found that there are cases where having a, a separate dependency can be a great advantage. Others where it might make more sense to have things uh, a, a little bit more tightly coupled, more of the, the mayo must approach. Uh, but at the end of the day, you know, we're all trying to make a sandwich with our preferred condiments and making sure it doesn't fall over. So, uh, so that's uh, pretty much it. Uh, definitely would encourage everybody to, uh, on Thursday, go to the, uh, the um, contribution day. I'm sure you've seen this slide a handful of times already, but always uh, a fun uh, effort, great way to give back to the project. And uh, would love to have any feedback that you have uh, on this session, um, either the session itself, you can go on the website and there's a survey, or there's a survey for DrupalCon uh, Amsterdam as well. Um, so we're pretty much up on time. Uh, might be able to sneak in a few questions if anybody has any. Uh, also, I'll, I'll be around outside or uh, at the conference. Happy to talk more about this stuff. But uh, thanks. <laughs> if anybody has questions, we have these fancy boxes. But I don't see any questions yet. Oh, got one. All right, we'll get get a box here. This this working? Um, so it's maybe part of a question and part of a suggestion. Uh, instead of the mayo and the mustard, maybe mayo and ketchup. That's <laughs> maybe a better combination. Um, that's just because uh, there's a little nuance in it, like you said. Some in some cases it works, in some cases it doesn't. Yep. I haven't really seen a lot of cases where we would approach this uh, in this way in, in my company, in the places I've worked, but it looks very interesting. But what I would ask is, how would you convince a company to invest uh, in this approach? Because at the start, it's a lot of overhead, just like when yep. you approach design systems in the general, because you have a lot of static content and static stuff that you have to add. So how would you approach trying to convince or to tell the team that this is a good way to, to do it, well, the things they would have to look at? Yeah, I, I honestly, the, the uh, uh, great question. And also, yeah, maybe we can make this ketchup instead of mustard. I'll, I'll get working on that. Uh, the biggest thing for me is probably reuse. If, if you uh, are confident that there are going to be situations where these things can be reused, uh, I think this approach makes a, a lot more sense. So whether it be, you know, there's the more potentially extreme case of using these same components in, in Drupal and WordPress, but even, uh, you know, having it not locked into one particular uh, Drupal project. Um, so if there really are opportunities to reuse maybe on similar sites, uh, things like that, it could make sense. And then also uh, from like an agency perspective, uh, as a way to build reusable components that you might be able to use on multiple projects, there's definitely some, some possibilities there. Um, but I would say that if, the, if you are really confident that these things will not be reused, um, it, it probably doesn't make sense. That's probably the biggest one that I consider. Awesome. Any other questions? Another one. Back there, if you can pass the, uh, the box. Thank you. Uh, what do you use uh, for a local environment uh, for such mixture? Uh, containers or? Landau. Yeah, I, I don't know that there was anything specific about our local environment uh, that had to change based on this approach. Uh, for our Drupal projects, we use uh, Drupal VM. Um, so that's what we used. And um, yeah, that's about it. We didn't like spin up individual containers for the uh, React side of things, so people would be running Node locally. Um, that's what we did anyway. Any other questions? Again, it's the end of the day. The fact that you guys even made it here is uh, wonderful in and of itself. All right, thanks. Happy to talk about this more if you have other questions, but thank you. Have a good one.